Hold up, I ain't trying to stump, man. But the Yeezys jumped over the jump, man. I be in and out of greeners like I'm Scotty Pippen. Left my elbow in the pot, I la Vince Carter. Bitch, you weren't with me shooting in the gym. James Harden with the range on me, nigga, way back. Coach, they won't knock me off my pivot, forget it. Been flowing stupid since Vince Carter was on some through the legs, arm and a hoop shit. And you can live through anything if magic made it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, now you do. Yes, sir. We are back. Round of applause for yourselves. You got a few things on the docket for today. When the money is worth the headache. Man, the NBA is dealing with a lot of ups and downs with this whole gambling issue. The influx of money is coming in and it's definitely crazy, but they're going to have to take the good and the bad with that. As JB Bickerstaff, the coach of the Cavs, had reported that his family got threatened over people losing their parlays. And is the money large enough for the NBA to deal with the degenerate side of gambling? Also, as the league is in the midst of their TV negotiations, the WNBA wants to ride the Caitlin Clark train all the way to the bank as they're looking to separate from the NBA and negotiate their own deal. And is Stephen Curry underappreciated? We've seen him in the past make sacrifices for Kevin Durant to come to the Warriors and get his accolades, but not too many stars at his level would do the same. We'll take a look at some of the inner nuances of Stephen Curry's leadership in Golden State. And speaking of underappreciation, we'll take a look at the Miami Heat, aka Heat culture, and some of the growing trends of the league that they were kind of ahead of their time on. As this season, we continue to see them pump guys out of that Pat Riley sweatshop Guys like Jaime Jaquez and Jovic out of nowhere have come along and, and added great contributions to this team, especially after they struck out in the Bradley Beal slash Damian Lillard free agency. So this will be a brand new series I'll be starting up called When the Money's Worth the Headache, and this will be Volume 1 starring JB Bickerstaff. As the Cavaliers coach let it be known in the past two years, he's been dealing with harassment issues from fans finding his and his family's personal numbers contacting them about blown parlays and all sorts of prop bets and this is where the league finds itself at a conundrum because the money is undeniable right now new york state alone in 2023 pulled in 19 billion in wagers and when that influx of money comes with fan engagement which all professional sports leagues are struggling to maintain especially with the younger demographics the gambling aspect for those above the age of 21 or 18 actually brings in a new layer of engagement with all the competition the leagues are fighting against. Streaming services, gaming, online personalities on YouTube, Twitch, etc, etc. But there's no denying, the gambling culture has always had a subculture of degeneracy that comes along with it. The types of people that it attracts. And for those of you that have been out in Las Vegas, you see it all over. There's people living in motels and it's not necessarily for drug related reasons. They're working and spending all their money in the casinos. And we're all human. And human nature got to kick in. People have addictions. There's going to be some negative sides to this. And some people going as far as to pestering JB Bickerstaff about their parlays not working out. It is really not surprising. Because gambling, sort of like the strip club in a way, have very close ties to the underworld. You see, when you go in the strip club, there's all types of people in there. It could be people from the sex trafficking world. The pimp world, girls that are hoeing on the side, drug dealers, scammers, all types of activity are going on. And these things have always been closely related to the whole strip club culture. And gambling, make no mistake about it, has that same subcultural link. There's all kinds of people operating within that whole entity and very corporatized professional sports world mixing in with this world. It's always going to be a clash. But this is why I call this series When the Money's Worth the Headache. For those of you watching the visual version, I'll pull up a chart for the amount of money wagered in just a few states. Keep in mind, sports betting is not legalized in most of the country. It's just only in a few states, but yet the amounts of money being wagered is by the billions. So you can only imagine when states like Texas and California get in on this action. And once those crazy dollar amount numbers start dangling over all these sports leagues... It's going to be very hard to deny, even with the small headaches and just compromising situations they may be put in from time in, time out. 
but the safety aspect is going to have to come into play here. It wouldn't surprise me in the next few years if the NBA opened up a brand new security division to deal with the fallout from all the negative effects of just having this influx of marketing and promotion for all this gambling. Once again, the money is so undeniable, the NBA is going out of their way to infuse this in their League Pass app. And for anyone that has ever used League Pass, many of you already know, there's a lot of issues regarding to the app being user-friendly, the blackouts, and issues with the navigation through the app. So instead of just fixing any of these things, the League actually went out of their way and infused a gambling aspect where they could not only accept payments, stats are updated, spreads are updated. You see how the League just overlooked a lot of the main complaints about the app and hired engineers to infuse gambling into it? You got to go out of your way to do something like that. And all those little fixtures as far as the navigation, those things are easy fixable. But again, the money that's being made is undeniable. But the side effects of having a corporate entity like the NBA infuse their culture with gambling, we're still not sure if that's a marriage made in heaven quite yet as they're still in their honeymoon phase, but there's definitely gonna be side effects. And even with the advertisements for a lot of these sports books, you hear them read off the side effects similar to the way one of these Viagra commercials run, where you hear them read out the side effects, but it's very sped up. And that same formula has been applied to the gambling ads. They're reading a paragraph at the end of the advertisement, and you hear glimpses of the side effects. Addiction, rehab, call this number, but the league at the same time is knocking out two birds with one stone with the fan engagement, especially with the younger demo, which they're struggling to engage that audience with the NBA product, as well as the influx of cash. So we'll see how this plays out. I know for a fact there's definitely going to be a volume two of this, as this is only the beginning. So the NBA in the midst of a television negotiation with their current partners, ESPN and Turner Sports, have experienced many twists and turns. But yet the plot continues to thicken. For starters, they expected Amazon to be potentially one of the players bidding on their television product. But instead, Amazon has kind of come in through the RSN business bankruptcy, aka Diamond Sports, and try to buy them out through the courts and enforcing some of the local teams to be streamed on Prime Video. And all of this would end up costing Amazon less than $500 million of investment money. The second plot twist is Discovery, aka they own Fox Sports, ESPN, and Turner Sports all coming together and announcing that they're going to launch an app. So two of the major NBA television partners, Turner Sports and ESPN, have decided to collaborate not only together, but with also another major media company in Discovery. So that consolidation hurts the NBA's leverage to have these different entities try to outbid each other in order to get the NBA, thus boosting their price up. And now finally, another plot twist. The WNBA is considering branching off and negotiating their own television deal because they're looking at their projections and they're seeing the 21% jump in the ratings last year, especially with the WNBA finals, which was very lit between the Aces and the New York Liberty. And come on, we all can't deny the momentum of women's college sports it's lit right now, and they're trying to ride that Caitlin Clark train all the way to the last stop, and to go from earning sixty million a year to possibly eighty to a hundred million. So they're trying to double up on their television deal, and they believe they can do that without the help of the NBA, as they pretty much are undervaluing the worth of the WNBA. And the Caitlin Clark wave is definitely real, because this is for the first time ever that women's college basketball has higher ratings than men's college hoops on Fox Sports. In the past, the model for the NBA was to attach the WNBA the same way ESPN attaches ABC programming onto their packages. If you want ESPN, you gotta grab ABC. The NBA Finals was on ABC even though that's a sub-channel. The NBA applies that same tethering business model to the WNBA. If you wanna bid and get NBA product on ESPN, you also got to take on these WNBA games. The ladies now, they believe that they can get a, a lot larger deal without being tethered to the NBA as far as contract negotiations. And they definitely can. I don't see why not. Even women's soccer leagues are going up in price. Just women's sports in general when you take a look at the landscape. But the only thing they would have to be careful about is not taking the biggest bag 
if it comes with certain stipulations of making their fan base actually do work into finding their games. This is where the MLS kind of comes into play because they have a deal with Apple TV and their games might not be as accessible as to having your games on ABC or ESPN. So the WNBA want to maximize their ability to make money, but also at the same time make their game very accessible so it can grow with a brand new fan base, a much younger audience. That accessibility will be key. But that Caitlin Clark wave is definitely real, boy. Woo! And you add on top of that how lit last season for the WNBA was, they got a hell of a deal coming their way. So when Stephen Curry captured his fourth NBA title, he began to enter a different realm among the many NBA legends that you could even go as far as making a valid argument that he's entered top 10. He was able to knock down certain narratives that might have been forgotten about as far as him winning not only NBA Finals MVP, but just being that player that can carry the Warriors all the way through the playoffs. And not only he dispelled those notions, he was able to capture an NBA title after being an underdog and having Andrew Wiggins as his second best player and Otto Porter Jr. starting the last three games of that series. That's why I said this is the point where Stephen Curry began to enter certain parts of the NBA hierarchy, which is rarefied air. And he did this at a time where the Golden State Warriors were going through ups and downs with other key contributors on the roster, getting hurt, dealing with injuries, getting older, and he was able to revamp his body coming back stronger and adding new elements to his game. And one of them being the fact that he was strong enough to even back down Al Horford and get into the paint. He was already a good finisher with the left and right hand going to the rack. But when he added the strength to it, it brought him up to a whole new level. Now in today's current NBA media landscape, it is very rare for certain pundits to actually give players their props because of the sports debate culture in which media members now pick a side the same way the political pundits pick a side. But Colin Cowherd gave Stephen Curry the proper praise and this is one of the very few times we've seen a media personality actually give Curry his proper praise with correct context. You guys check it out, and every once in a while, I'll check in. You know, we pay so much attention, and probably should, to LeBron's greatness, age, and longevity. We forget Steph's 36 very soon. Is he the anti-LeBron in many forms? Built a dynasty with his first team super loyal to friends and relationships, finesse over power, shooting over driving, leaves oxygen in the room for others. And that right there is an underestimated part about Stephen Curry. Similar to Dwayne Wade, he left room for Kevin Durant to come to Golden State and shine. There are not too many players on Steph's level that would ever make that sacrifice. And it goes the same way for Dwayne Wade. The NBA Finals MVP, Mr. Miami himself, stepping aside and letting LeBron come to Miami in order for them to achieve team success. The top superstars in the league definitely have to have an ego in order to get to that level. And just them having the humility to put team success before their individual accolades is very underestimated. Doesn't have to always be the number one guy. Just think about what he has dealt with this season, Steph Curry. Draymond Green, long suspension. The death of an assistant coach. Andrew Wiggins, another personal leave. The drama of Klay Thompson going to the bench. Chris Paul arrives, Hall of Fame guard, uh-oh, and then misses a big chunk of the season. Bob Myers leaves as a beloved general manager. He's also trying to connect two generations. Two of their best young players, 21 years old, and then you got Draymond, Chris Paul, him. And Jonathan Kaminga is definitely coming for a spot on that roster. He's made it well known, calling out Steve Kerr during the regular season about his playing time. They got young pups on that team that are starving to play with Curry. And here's Steph, 27 a game, cool as ever, shooting 41% on. Wow, 41% from three. And this is Curry moving off ball, running around nonstop at the age of 36. He's in tremendous shape. He's doing what Ray Allen used to do or Reggie Miller. Just all that running through screens, cutting all that off ball movement while at the same time carrying the scoring load for this team as Andrew Wiggins had, had one hell of a fall off. One hell of a fall off. 
I mean, for anyone to win a championship with that guy being your second best player, that's a feat in itself. On threes, drama has surrounded him forever, even when he first got there. Do you keep Steph, Monte Ellis? He creates the Splash Brothers. The KD comes, KD leaves. The Draymond stuff. The changing of the guard, Mark Jackson to Steve Kerr. None of it phases him. He's never frazzled and remains the absolute rock, foundational piece, the steady soul of this great franchise. Now with the Warriors, this franchise is very interesting because Steph by far is the most talented, but all these guys kind of serve a purpose. Klay Thompson, his selflessness is very important here. The fact that he's never really complained about being the wing guy. We've seen legendary players like Scottie Pippen now all of a sudden bitch and moan about his insecurities of potentially being an afterthought or just a Jordan sidekick. But Klay Thompson has played into his role, even though he's good enough to be the key guy on a lot of teams during his prime. He is the enforcer of this team. Every team needs a guy like Draymond, the rah-rah guy, the guy that's going to call everyone out when they're fucking up, including himself. Just a person to bring out the emotions of this team. And make no mistake about it, forget Draymond's stat line. He is a bona fide first ballot Hall of Famer. His defense, his basketball IQ, the way he organizes the switches on screens, his shit is all time, man. That's why I say this team has a very unique makeup. The puzzle of the Golden State Warriors can never be fully complete, missing any one of these guys. Once again, the talent of Stephen Curry, the emotion, swagger, and defensive intelligence of Draymond Green, and finally, the selflessness of Klay Thompson, never complaining about his role, being a great two-way wingman for Stephen Curry. Forget his superior game. The difference between him and other great guards, James Harden and Kyrie Irving, is a mile wide in terms of leadership, a get-it quality, self-awareness, intangibles. He's a remarkable player. You don't get any of this ridiculous, I am the man, put some respect on it nonsense. It's all about basketball IQ, working well with others, making things work, lubricating, not agitating, adapting, evolving, dealing with KD. He's had a lot of players with a lot of baggage and drama. Just look at this year what he's dealt with and hear the Warriors again. He's also never demanding on coaches. You know, I like LeBron, but he can be passive, aggressive, little drops in the media, putting pressure on a GM, an owner, or a coach. We've seen Always trying to get guys traded on his team, looks them in the face, smiles, bigs them up, and then asks for them to get traded. Plenty of players. I'm pretty sure Russell Westbrook is one of them, D'Angelo Russell, Kyrie Irving. Yeah, that's that's LeBron's MO. Eric Spolster and down in Miami to get him fired the way he bumped into him. There's a lot that comes with LeBron James. You know, the half dozen times in L.A. And I think the four best guards I've ever seen in my life in professional basketball, and I've watched it since the early 70s, are Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Kobe Bryant, and Steph Curry. And he's the only one that could play with all of them. Get a Damn, Cowherd, you're not going to say Oscar Robinson? I know Oscar was on his way out, but all these guys you named are pretty much his babies. The same way Trey Young is Stephen Curry's baby, or Kobe Bryant is Michael Jordan's baby. These guys were watching these players while growing up, and they basically modeled their games after them. Along with all of them. You could put him on any all-time team. If he played with Michael, he'd be like, hey, I'll just run around. If you spot me open, throw it. Kobe was hard to play with. Steph could play with him. He worked with KD. KD can be a lot. Go mentally, KD can be a lot mentally, but he's also another player that's a perfect fit into any team system. He doesn't require holding on to the ball nonstop. Even though recently in Brooklyn and in Phoenix, sometimes they have him playing that uh, point forward role a little bit too much. He should be in a more catch and shoot role. And I wouldn't be shocked if Stephen Curry actually wanted KD to stay in Golden State. That team would have actually achieved what the Miami Heat with LeBron James wanted to achieve when he was like not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. He was trying to get six rings in Miami. KD going to Golden State was a perfect fit. 
and they could have definitely achieved that. Got along great. He gets along with everybody, and that's an underrated skill. I love LeBron, think he's the all-time best at doing great things across the board, but there are some things about Steph I strongly prefer, and last night, another classic performance. The band is finally all back together. They add Chris Paul. It's a new GM, the death of an assistant. Clay comes off the bench, young kids everywhere, and they're blowing out Milwaukee. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to be said about Steph. Yes, indeed. But when it comes to Steph and Curry, the conversation around him will be very interesting as he inches closer and closer to retirement because make no mistake about it, he is definitely in rarefied air. And when you compare him to the other legendary point guards, guys like Magic Johnson, Isaiah Thomas, you're going to have to put him up there. It's actually going to be more difficult to find reasons why not to have him up there. So we'll see. As the Stephen Curry chapter is not quite done yet, he still may have more prime seasons left. So as we're midway through the NBA season, we're seeing a lot of coverage still happening for teams like the Los Angeles Lakers and the Golden State Warriors, even though they're sitting in the ninth and 10th seed of their conferences. And this is one of the many flaws of today's current NBA media landscape in which stars are way too emphasized instead of team roster construction when it comes to predicting teams that are possibly going to go ahead and compete for an NBA championship. And when you take a look at the landscape, especially with this new CBA kicking in next season and the league beginning to transition into a new phase where the league this summer will expand the second round of the NBA draft into its own event as now the draft will take place in two days. And the reason why this is being emphasized is because those second round picks are going to become very valuable, especially for teams that are competing on a championship level. And we're also going to begin to see the trend of drafting that second round polished player perhaps someone that did four years in college already and quickly come in and contribute to teams that are competing at a very high level we see this play out with the denver nuggets as they have numerous draft picks guys like christine braun julian strawweather peyton watson and other undrafted rookies all hovering around the age of 24 or entering into their second season while hitting the age of 22. so this will be a growing trend especially as teams have multiple star players that are eating up a lot of cap space and teams avoiding being in that second apron within that luxury tax while try to avoid the scenario just having restrictions placed on them due to the fact that they're in that second apron. So the second round picks are going to become more and more valuable. And another team that's been way ahead of this curve and I want to emphasize on is the Miami Heat. And you can see the continuous trend of them just adding players to their roster instead of chasing stars, like the way they avoided Damian Lillard and Bradley Beal. Not only their contracts were way too high, the fit wouldn't have worked out quite as well. And even though they lost a few of their role players from last year's finals run, they were still able to yet find players that fit well into the system. Guys like Hamis Hakez Jr. and Jovic. And the Heat, just like the Denver Nuggets, are continuing following this trend of not only fine players that are older and may have done four years in college in the draft and fitting them right into their system, but the Heat also possess a lot of intangibles that tend to get overlooked by the national NBA media overall at large. Some of the Heat players, particularly their star Jimmy Butler, has intangibles similar to Jalen Brunson with the footwork, the discipline, the relentlessness. And another championship player that you could look at that played years ago was the Portland Trailblazers current coach Chauncey Billups. Another guy that was overlooked because maybe his athleticism wasn't quite there, but the intangibles was definitely there. Big shot Billups, the way he performed in very crucial moments, that's something that you cannot measure. And we've seen a very talented player in Chris Paul actually fold in the biggest playoff moments, including that turnover he had in the NBA Finals going up against the Bucks. Again, this is going back to my point of the NBA media at large sometimes getting too stuck on stars. That's why they're still saying the Warriors and the Lakers, even though we're more than midway through the season, they're still saying that these teams, even though sitting at the ninth and 10th seed, could still make their way past the play-in and have a deep playoff push. And the same thing also applies to Dame and Giannis out in Milwaukee. Even though they have a flawed roster construction, in which Doc Rivers numerous times have even stated 
when he went on his little press run that he should have never really took over this job midway through the season is because the new ownership, they sort of star chased themselves into constructing a flawed roster that's very top heavy. But when you look at teams like the Miami Heat, they're going to give the Milwaukee Bucks a lot of issues going into the playoffs, especially with that weak ass perimeter defense the Bucks have. The constant off ball movement by the Miami players, even guys coming off the bench, is going to give that superstar driven roster, that very top heavy, talented roster, a lot of issues because they lack depth. And the Heat don't really seem concerned about where they finish as long as they get into the playoffs. Because what got them to the NBA Finals two out of the last four seasons is the intangibles. They have a lot of heart, similar to many legendary boxers we've seen over the years. Guys like Sugar Ray Leonard, Bernard Hopkins, Marvin Hagler. Some of the fights those guys had, like the brawl in Montreal or Marvin Hagler versus Tommy Hearns, one of the greatest three rounds of boxing in history. We see the heart that these guys come back with, not wanting to lose. The Heat have a lot of those intangibles. And you can smell it and see it right off these guys. Especially with Jimmy Butler. The NBA is such a star-driven league that the Philadelphia 76ers did not realize when they went to the Eastern Conference Finals with Jimmy Butler on their roster that the person really to get rid of at the time was Ben Simmons, not Jimmy Butler. But again, the NBA media being so star-driven, maybe because of the marketing, they did not even realize it should have never been Butler to leave and go to Miami. It should have been the 76ers to resign him and then send Ben Simmons in a trade somewhere else. But yet that Eastern Conference Finals appearance by the 76ers is the pinnacle and I would say the peak of the 76ers with this whole Joel Embiid era. But Jimmy Butler spoke about the ups and downs of the Miami Heat season and what's their main focus and how at this very moment, approaching the end of the season, he's getting ready to revy the engines up and activate playoff Jimmy. And they're not really too concerned about what seating they get as long as they get in. This is how confident the Heat are. I'm just different. I think this is when you're supposed to be playing your best basketball and you have to find a way to get your team to win these games when you're talking about the playoffs coming around. But even right now, you're getting everybody into their roles. You just keep a couple things in your pocket all year long. And whenever you do it at a certain point of the year, they deem it something else like playoff Jimmy. But it's just me playing the long game throughout the season. I know that I'm really good at this game, and I know I could do a lot of things well on the basketball court. There are just times when you have to step it up a notch. You can't show the opponent everything now. You have to always keep people guessing. Whatever y'all want to call it, playoff Jimmy or that crazy motherfucker emo Jimmy, I don't care. We're good man. I just want to get into the playoffs. That's it. We get into the playoffs, then we and I can take care of a lot. But I think us as a group, we're going to be just fine. And the Heat are indeed playing the long game. And they've done this plenty of times before where they rest guys like Jimmy Butler like last year before making their Eastern Conference final run against the Boston Celtics. And the Heat are playing the long game during the season because they've done this before where they kind of took their foot off the pedal during the regular season. And then they revved things up when it came close to playoff time. And last year, we seen them make the finals. And they implemented the same tactic in 2020 when they made the finals against the Lakers. But again, the growing trends of teams drafting four-year players in the late rounds who are a bit more polished and can come in and contribute right away. This is a growing trend. And their rookie sensation Jaime Jaquez sat down with JJ Redick and he was asked about the old stereotype of the four-year college player. You guys check it out and every once in a while, I'll check in. Do you think there's a you think there's a bias um, like you you staying four years in college? Do you think that led to some of this a little mm. bit as well as people being like, okay, there's a reason why he didn't come out? I I, I don't know honestly. Um, maybe um, I would just say this. I know that staying four years is a uh, is kind of like an anomaly nowadays, but I think at the same time, like everyone's path is different. Um, I know you, there, there's guys in the league today that have played four years at college and are having great, great careers. I mean, Jalen Brunson, for example, another guy, Josh Richardson um, on my team. And then I think, you know, there's plenty of others. Malcolm Brogdon, I think, played four years as well. Um, I mean, there's been plenty of guys that have, that have done it. And, I, and you know, I don't want to say I'm the only one or I'm starting this. I, there's guys that have done it before. I, I wouldn't say it's for everybody. 
Um, you got freshmen nowadays who are going number one pick, and I, I'm all for that. It's just whatever path you feel is best for you. And, um, you know, that's the message I try to preach. Keep in mind, this trend will begin to shift. As now, Adam Silver had announced that the NBA draft will be a two-day event as teams want more time to evaluate the second round because the second round picks nowadays will be very important, especially with this new CBA for teams like the Denver Nuggets, the Miami Heat, the Phoenix Suns. That's one way Kevin Durant could replenish that Suns roster outside of him, Beal, and Devin Booker. We don't know if Grayson Allen is going to qualify and get more money in the offseason as he's had so far a great year. But one way for them to counteract just having that expensive roster year in, year out, is to do what the Denver Nuggets did. Draft four-year guys, either in the late first round or into the second round, or just get undrafted guys. But just getting guys that could overall come in and contribute and understand certain team concepts right away. These are going to be very valuable assets to have. And it makes sense why the league had expanded the second round of the NBA draft into its own separate day. Yeah, another one. Yeah, four <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah. You just said, omitted, you said, you said I wasn't one. a good player? All right. <laughs> This guy is just throwing <laughs> subtle shots and direct shots. All right. The stigma surrounding the four-year college player, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down a notch. Definitely that stereotype will change due to the landscape. And mainly the biggest contributing factor to this is how teams will construct these rosters under the new CBA rules. <laughs> what, did, what do you oh, think? What, what, what do you think, though, staying four years gave you in terms of an advantage by the time you got here to the NBA and playing for the Miami Heat? I think the biggest thing or the biggest advantage that I gained is understanding winning and what that what that takes and what that means um, and, and really understanding the little things about basketball. So I think, you know, in, in one year as a, as a freshman, it's kind of hard to really take that in and, and understand what that is. And, you know, you have four years of development, especially under the coach that I had where winning was everything. Uh, if we ever lost a game, you know, it was like the end of the world. Um, so learning what it took and the work and the preparation, um, I think, really helped me to take that next step and go into the NBA with that knowledge of, you know, what it takes to win and what that really means. And with some of the most talented draftees coming into the league, guys like Jonathan Kaminga, Jalen Green, Scoot Henderson, They've all come up under systems where winning is not emphasized. That's why we see the G League Ignite and the NBA sort of phase out that program because guys are still coming in not ready, not understanding certain team concepts. That's why you see Kaminga have all the tangibles. You know, he jumps high. He's very athletic. He can clearly play the game, but we see him bump heads with Steve Kerr because there's a lack of understanding for certain concepts. So this is some of the intangibles that the four-year college player that gets drafted in the second round, late first round, these are the type of things that they come with. But we can't see it because it doesn't pop out physically on the court. It's all up here in their head. But all that progression and information is already downloaded. When in the inverse, we see guys like Jalen Green playing freestyle basketball out in Houston the first two years he was out there with no type of structure. And we've seen very similar struggles in transitioning into the NBA format from Scoot Henderson and Jalen Green. All three of these guys come out of G League Ignite, in which that program by the league does not stress winning enough. It's almost like a glorified AEU that actually gives guys a salary. I got, I got a question on that, actually, because Coach K used to always talk about uh, unpacking your bags. Mm -hmm. And I remember... The first time he referenced that, he was talking about Elton Brand. And Elton came in as a freshman, had some success. There was a lot of buzz about him. You know, that class, I think William Avery left after his sophomore year. Elton left after his sophomore year. Corey Maggette left after his freshman year. This was all 99. It's the first time anybody had left Duke early. And so when I got there in, in 02, it was, you know, he was talking to, we had a the heralded freshman class. He talked to us about unpacking your bags. And all that meant was that you're sort of all in to mm -hmm. your time, whatever your time is. My time was four years. Your time was four years. Some guys, their time is a year. Some guys, it's two years. But while you're there unpacking your bags. And I think one of the issues, there are many, 
But one of the issues right now in the one and done era is that I don't think not uh, enough guys unpack their bags. And what happens there is the two things you just talk about. You don't necessarily learn the value of winning and losing. And because your bags aren't unpacked and you're not all in because your mind's somewhere else or, you know, you were a heralded high school player, McDonald's All-American, and I'm I'm, I'm going to leave after this year and I know I'm going to leave after this year. You're not actually paying attention to whatever's being taught. And specifically, I, I, I want actually specifics. Like, what are the things? Because there's a lot of guys that have said this. Like, Antoine Jameson said this recently. Pop said this recently. We've got all these guys that have uber skills. But the fundamentals, I think Pop referenced maybe screening angles or Pop referenced footwork, whatever. The fundamentals have been lost a little bit. So where do you, so like specifically, like for me, I'll give you an example. I was a catch and shoot guy. Yeah. I was a catch and shoot guy in high school. Mm-hmm. When I got to Duke, two things happened. Later on in my career, I got to play on the ball. I got to run some pick and rolls. And then I spent so much time, not on YouTube, but actual film, studying <laughs> Reggie Miller, Ray Allen, Rip Hamilton. So I actually got better playing off the ball. I got better in my movement. I got better setting up screens. Those were the things for me that mattered once I got to the NBA. What were the things for you that mattered that you learned, the fundamentals, because you stayed four years? I mean, man, I could go on for a really long time. I'll say one that sticks out to me that my coach always said is, honestly, it's a pretty easy one, but listening. Like, you know, listening and focusing, understanding scouting reports, understand, you know, what coach is trying to tell you. Um, you know, not how he's saying, but what he's saying, um, things like that. And then, I mean, defensively, um, you know, what, what it means to, you know, stun the gap and get back out to the corner, you know, being help without giving up open threes, you know, understanding what the low man is, um, you know, offensively understanding spacing, um, how to get a great shot, understanding the importance of just swinging the ball once or twice and how much that opens the floor. I mean, um, you know, understanding, you know, boxing out, rebounding, the importance of the game within the game. A lot of the things that he's describing are the exact issues that are causing Ume Udoka and Jalen Green to bump heads out in Houston. And also Steve Kerr and Jonathan Kaminga. All right, if we win the rebounding battle, um, they're a great rebounding team and their offense relies heavily on offensive rebounds. Okay, that's something that we need to take away. You know, listening, listening to that and applying it into your game is one of the biggest you know, skills I think anyone can have is, is really just listening um, and applying that into the game or, um, you know, who is their, who is their main guys? Who is, who is a shooter? What hand do they like to go to, you know, take away those buckets and, you know, transition, for example, um, you know, we got to get the rebound secure so we can set up our, or we got to go back and set up our defense, just things like that. Um, I think are really crucial and, and over four years of that constantly getting pounded into your head, um, you know, it really sticks. Yeah, it becomes programmed into your brain a little bit. Exactly. Were there were there any things like conceptually that were different when you got to the Heat? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know spacing and and you know I, I wouldn't necessarily like to me, you know, college is plays and the NBA is a lot of actions. Um, so I think that conceptually was a big thing. Obviously, shorter shot clock. You, know, you got to get shots on goal. Um, but just, you know, running quick actions and being unpredictable. Whereas in college, you know, you got a lot of set plays. Okay, let's set up, um, you know, let, let's take our time. Let's get the best shot possible. In the NBA, it's like, all right, let's get a great action. You know, first shot available, first great shot available. We got to take it because, you know, the shot clock's short. And a lot of times if you pass up a, a, a good shot, you're not going to get a better one. And so I think that's a big thing transitioning from college into the NBA is just understanding how much faster the game moves um, and pacing and, and, and how much easy buckets are of value um, and just things like that. Those concepts are not really stressed out like that because overall that program is really to cultivate the talents of certain key guys. So let's just say if someone is in G League Ignite and they don't make it to the NBA draft, so they're right back into the G League Ignite. Now their job becomes to help out the new crop of players coming in to elevate their game. So it's almost like they have to take a back burner just to showcase the brand new talent that's coming in. And winning games is never even stressed out. 
They're just playing against other pro level talent. But at the end of the day, the whole premise is for the older guys to cultivate the games of the younger guys. So they have to give them the shots. They have to help them develop. So you start to see why Kaminga has taken so long to really impact the game and why Steve Kerr is hesitant at times to play him. And you also see why Scoot Henderson went through major struggles, especially early in the season out in Portland. And then finally going to the Houston Rockets, you see why them getting better polished players like Fred Van Vliet, Dylan Brooks, and also a coach that's going to emphasize a system, an actual culture. You see why all of a sudden Jalen Green does not fit as well with that whole infrastructure. Because the same freestyle basketball he was playing in his first two years with the Rockets, that style of play that he's so accustomed to from AAU to G League Ignite to coming into the league and being allowed to play like that for the first two years, this shit just doesn't work, man. He might be learning these concepts for the very first time. <laughs> That's the ironic part. And best believe, there's been many top-level talented players in the history of the NBA that have actually stressed out that they didn't learn certain concepts until there was about nine years into the league. I mean, we've seen Amari Stoudemire stating that he had to learn defensive concepts once he joined the New York Knicks. And this is a player that made multiple Western Conference Finals, but yet he was learning things that he should have learned within his first two years of being in the league. Okay, we're going to run this play. You're going to come off a pin down. Then you're going to swing it to Terry. And then Jaime is going to run out of the pick. And then he's going to slip. And then we're going to get bad because we want to get to that chase action with Duncan and Bam on the weak side, right? That's the yeah. ultimate thing. That's a set play. Whereas in the NBA, you have to understand all these concepts on the fly. It's a, it's more free flowing is what I'm saying and what you're saying yeah. too. So I, I, I understand. That. I just wanted to clarify exactly no, what you were talking that. about. JJ Redick right here will stress and emphasize that they knew exactly what they needed on their roster. And Jaime was the perfect fit because of the intangibles as well as the tangibles that he brought to the table because they get a brunt because they get a blunt of the blame for not getting Damian Lillard missing out on Bradley Beal but these guys in reality have never really played a style of basketball that contributes to long playoff pushes and just overall being a winning formula of basketball Dame out in Portland was allowed to chuck up a bunch of shots his team was always at the bottom of the league as far as defense and Bradley Beal was stuck in Washington in no man's land. All he had to do was get his points. His team had no expectations at all. So it's not like all of a sudden these guys are going to flip the switch when they come down to Miami and make the sudden changes and get acclimated right away. This is why Pat Riley was hesitant about trading for these two guys. Because for starters, Pat Riley already knows what championship players look like. And for two, because of their salary bump, the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze. I was talking to Spo. Uh, last week about you as well and and something he said to Mark Jones was he was talking about how one of your advantages is just conceptual or not conceptually but but intrinsically your matchups night to night you can find an advantage depending on the matchup he, he mentioned guys like OG right he didn't say him specifically but guys like OG that are like size that can move their feet right that's not an advantage but if you're being guarded by a bigger player, uh, right, you can go out to the perimeter, you can use your handle, you can use your footwork, get by him. If you're being guarded by a smaller player, you can go down to the post, use your size. And I thought that was really interesting that he he found that, and he, he sold us. He's like, he, I found that right away with Jaime. He, I, a previous conversation I had, he was like, he was like, he really struggled the first day of training camp. And then the second day, I was like, oh shit, that kid's got something. <laughs> Did you did you did you feel like you struggled the first day of training camp? Maybe it wasn't training camp. Maybe it was just preseason pickup. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think when you get there, it's definitely it's all coming at you so fast. You know, you're trying to learn different things. Um, you know, you're you're seeing guys, and you know, you're you're in the NBA for the first time, and you just you know, and in my eyes, I was trying not to mess anything up. Um, but I think you know, eventually you get more comfortable. And then I realized that, you know, I belonged here. This is what, what I, this is why they drafted me. And this is what I was here to do. Um, so I guess as, as the time went on, I just became more comfortable. Um, and as far as, you know, trying to find an advantage, I think it's the most important thing is just trying to find or 
taking what the defense gives you. Um, I think that's the biggest thing and trying to slow the game down as, as much as possible uh, to try to find advantages in any way I can. So there you have it. The Miami Heat are definitely not a team to sleep on. And with Jaime Jaquez, he is part of the growing trend of the archetype of player that teams are looking for either in the late first round or second round. But players like him will be very valuable going forward, especially for the teams that are already competing on a high level. They're going to want to draft guys that maybe played three to four years in college. Their rookie NBA season will be at the age of 23, 24, and they're ready to contribute right away, especially with their salary not being as high. Because with the new CBA, having players like this is going to be very important. And everything kind of comes together when you look at the fact that the league is extending the second round of the NBA draft to its own individual day. So it is what it is. This will be a growing trend going forward. And until next time, you fellas stay safe. Peace.